So we're at 12.15 now, so I'm going to start the webinar of officially. Um, so uh, just had a, a quick question at the beginning of the webinar here, which was um, you know, which, which books are good for learning some market analysis. Um, I'm a chartered Mac technician. I had to read a, a whole number of books in order to get that um, designation. A lot of them on, on um, specifically on technical analysis. So there's a lot of books uh, with technical analysis in the title which are specifically pertaining to how to, to read the charts. <coughs> um, so yeah, as someone who's read a few, I certainly recommend those. Um, the, uh, the sort of godfather, if you like, of technical analysis. There's, well, there's really a couple. Um, Martin Pring. So maybe I should just write this down into the general chat window here. Martin Pring. And um, is Murph, uh, I'm actually googling here because the other godfather is, is Murphy. I'm trying to remember is um, <coughs> John Murphy. These really, if you, the funny thing about these books is that I've read multiple, but I always come back to these, and you learn something new every time. And I just keep thinking that actually. You know, you if you if you read and really understood all the things in in the books that these guys have written on technical analysis, you're you're pretty much covered. Um, it it's got all you need for the kind of simple analysis that can be used to build a trading system that you can consistently trade and uh, and hopefully profit from. In terms of fundamental analysis, it, there's such a wide gambit. There's so many different approaches to um, to investing and trading, um, obviously all of different times of time horizon. I would say maybe the first step would be determining <coughs> whether you're interested in value investing, which is buying at lower depressed prices, or uh, or more like momentum trading, or momentum investing, growth investing where you're, built, you're buying something that's already going higher uh, in the case of a stock, a company that's already growing and you're just uh, you, you're basically trading on the idea that that's going to keep going. Um, so I, rather than listing uh, numerous specific books, I would say sort of, you know, which one of those kind of makes some sort of intuitive sense to you. Um, the value investing one is tough, particularly on a sort of trading type environment because you know, we're you know the way we do the trading here is you know we we use oftentimes use some some leverage, and we're trading typically on shorter term moves, and it's difficult to determine the long term value of a company um, within the short term. Often you have to kind of ride out a bit of pain. So someone like Warren Buffett can do that very well, but uh, you know if you've got more of kind of the shorter term trading mindset, uh, obviously just for most of us distinctly less funds available to trade than than Warren Buffett. Then actually sometimes that value investing approach isn't as appropriate and trading does lend itself a bit more to momentum investing what I talk about in these webinars <coughs> um, a lot is the support and resistance which can sometimes trigger <coughs> excuse me a, a breakout and, and and some some new momentum coming into the market so I'll try and touch on that a bit when we get into it so we're through those terms and conditions there on so I'll, I'll bring up the, the trading screen the way I typically work things through here is that um, I mean I've got various watch lists that I have set up on my screen but the de the um, the default here is is the indices effects and commodities I'm going to start with the indices um, which have been interesting of late particularly in US markets because we're we're in record highs in the Dow Jones industrial average and the S&P 500 as I'm sure you know so the question is, can this break out to record highs, sustain itself, or are we looking actually at more like a fake out? So you can see, just looking at this weekly candlestick chart, which can be good to, even if you're trading short term, just to have a quick check at the start of the week of the uh, the market that you're trading, to give, an, give yourself an idea. You can see that the momentum has slowed. Look at the massive turnaround from the Brexit lows right up to 18,000 in the Dow and we sped up in the next couple of weeks but 
really ran out a bit of steam last week. You know, still made gains, but not really quite, not not uh, nearly quite as impressive. Um, but it, does that mean we're just looking at more steady gains going forward, or are we about to roll over? So, looking at this chart, you can see we've broken out of this trading range that we've mentioned in in every webinar for for years now. <coughs> but uh, we can gain a bit more detail by dropping down to the daily chart one thing that I'm looking at when you're in record territory obviously bit target to a bit difficult rather to, to target specific numbers on the upside because we've never been there before so there's no previous price action uh, above a record high obviously so one thing you can use is this uh, <coughs> Fibonacci extension you can find that here down in the draw tools not a retracement but an extension um, in this case, because we're in an uptrend, draw off a, the uh, second to last low to the peak, uh, to the last, latest low, and then it gets you up to a projection point. And so this is the first one, actually. It's the, uh, I think I've actually lost the level there, but it's the, it's, uh, let me draw it in again. I've, I've drawn it, it's right at this 18700 mark. So if I hover over here, I can edit this indicator what I can just put in is 61.8 so it's the same Fibonacci levels but there you can see it's pretty much at this 18.7 we've got so a round number confluence and this 61.8 level here's the 100 percent so it's kinda like this move again from here would take us up to 19.722 so that's a really big bull market type scenario obviously that's that's us pushing well into a, a nice new uptrend um, so if we get through 18,700, you know that's uh, obviously we've got the the big round number of 19,000 in the way, uh, but that could be an eventual target up there at 19,700. And um, you know just because we're in record highs, don't believe we have to drop again. We don't. It's certainly, certainly, you know every uh, every uh, new bull market starts with highs getting taken out. It has to, obviously. So at the moment short term we're still very much in a um, uh, in a kind of bull bullish scenario we've broken out of the old range where we're prices are trending higher signs of a bit of a lost momentum but if you look at this daily RSI we're we're above the um, the 60 that was resistance we're pushing up towards the 70 level so still more room to go because we're not overbought the event risk this week are um, I would say two uh, I mentioned in my mid-morning note there's sort of two things I think needed to, to keep this this bull run going is um, earnings um, they're expected still to drop year over year corporate earnings uh, particularly in the US but there a lot of the results are coming in ahead of expectations so the drop is not quite as as big as some were expecting and so if results can keep coming ahead of expectations that's a good thing <coughs> secondly we've got two central banks this week the Fed and the Bank of Japan uh, the Fed, what we want to hear is that uh, they're um, still uh, sort of steady on, on their on their uh, policy outlook. So they're not going to make any heavy hints that uh, they're fed, uh, that they're about to raise interest rates anytime soon. They probably are just going to kind of change the language a little bit because of the last non-farm payrolls result uh, was a big turnaround. Um, so the June non-farm payrolls. Uh, was back into the 200 plus territory whereas obviously in May it was re they, the US economy barely grew any jobs it was a complete um, aberration it looks like at the moment um, but obviously it was a bit of a, poor, uh, a reason for concern at the June meeting of the Fed <coughs> um, so what we probably want to hear them say is that yeah well, the jobs outlook has improved a bit but we're still a bit uncertain and you know we're going to try again um, <coughs> Uh, we're we're going to keep monitoring things. Mm. So that that probably isn't going to be, you know, he says, uh, much of a market event for the Fed. Um, as long as they don't, uh, as long as they're vaguely positive on the economy, but don't signal too aggressively they're going to hike rates. That 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 shouldn't be enough to stop prices going higher, in my opinion. Um, the other, the the bigger one, unusually, is uh, normally the Fed is front and center this week it's actually the Bank of Japan uh, where early on Friday we'll find out whether uh, they actually ramp up their stimulus for the first time in a, in a while they cut rates um, and that wasn't received too well um, now they uh, the, the government in Japan has been 
uh, re-elected, got a new mandate to double down on this policy of um, fiscal and monetary policy uh, stimulus. So it looks like they're going to pump a lot more yen into the Japanese economy uh, via spending programs um, and they're also going to potentially cut interest rates more into the negative uh, but I think what the bigger hope here is that they're going to do more QE, so buy more uh, government bonds, uh, municipal bonds and even in, in, in Japan they actually buy ETFs as well. So we're looking at the US 30 here but probably the biggest direct beneficiary would be um, as we've got it here, the Japan 225. So keeping the kind of chart analysis in mind, um, if you think the Bank of Japan are about to, to ramp up stimulus, what you're basically eyeing up here is that this range that we've been in for a while is going to get broken. So the top of this range is just shy of um, 18,000 on the Japan 225 on, the, on, the, on our proxy for the Nikkei. We've got 17,000 in the way at the moment, so you know, you're basically wagering on 17 breaking, um, 17.250 ish breaking, which was a bit of a sort of interim level, and then up to those highs again. Because um, Japan obviously goes without saying that Japan Japanese stocks are going to benefit if their central bank actually start directly buying stocks alongside other risky assets, or more of them, I should say. Mm. Um, what's the chance of them doing that? It seems high. That's the general expectation is that they're going to do something. Um, the the other the other consideration here is helicopter money, um, because what the Bank of Japan have done so far hasn't really worked. So there's the dis there's a possibility that even if they in increase QE, the markets could be disappointed because they haven't done helicopter money. That's basically giving money directly to the public for them to go out and spend on the economy and rev up growth and inflation. <laughs> so um, helicopter money will be the other element here. It's, it was last week we had a few rumours toing and froing. Um, I'll swap around out of stock indices into um, currencies temporarily. This is obviously the big other big one to watch is the, the Japanese yen ahead of this policy announcement. <coughs> um, Last week we had there was an interview from the BBC saying that um, uh, that uh, Kuroda, the Bank of Japan, had, had ruled out helicopter money. That the the yen rallied on that, uh, but then it later sort of uh, transpired that that interview had happened before the election in Japan over a month ago, so it was out of date. So we're we're a bit unsure where we stand. Um, so it's possible that even though oh, just over a month ago he was against it, um, things have changed enough that he's now for it. And um, <coughs> if you read uh, my colleague Michael Houston's morning note, you mentioned he mentioned how uh, when negative rates were first introduced, um, he had said three days before he was not a fan of negative rates, and then introduced them. <coughs> so there is a slight precedent here in um, in Japan at the central bank of kind of trying to shock markets. So the the result here would be um, a drop in dollar yen, and we're at some big resistance. Uh, drop in dollar yen. Um, um, sorry, uh, if they actually introduce something, um, it would be a, a breakout here in the, in the, w, in the dollar yen, uh, yen, d uh, yen going down in value and uh, the, the dollar, uh, dollar going up in value. And so we have a potential double bottom pattern here of sorts, where a low, which is a big number, 100, has been tested twice. And we're just right at, um, so this was a trend line that was in place, got a false breakout, and we're back here, and it works kind of twofold. Um, so this is a significant level. If we push through it, it's one of these examples of a mo momentum breakout. We've broken through a significant level. Uh, my feeling is that it would it would pick up steam, and we'd be we'd be up towards the 200-day moving average, and in, in not, uh, you know, in uh, in a pretty quick amount of time, if the Bank of Japan step up the stimulus. If they don't, likewise, I think we'll be heading to these lows pretty quickly because that will be, um, you know, that was the main reason for this rebound off 100 is that um, the yen is going to stop going up in value because the central bank is going to intervene. So I'm going to flip back um, attention now to the, the UK. Um, obviously the further we move away from the referendum, the slightly um, out of focus, we're, the, the UK is moving slightly out of focus in terms of general um, influence on, on global markets. We stuttered around 
Um, always good to look at the the big round numbers, and so you can see that we basically stuttered around six seven hundred. But to me, the move on Friday suggests that we're um, we've you know we've comfortably closed above six uh, six seven hundred, and the next natural test would be you know looking at some of these previous levels before we had the big drop off. You can see that we had a re big rebound off of uh, just above six uh, six eight hundred six eight oh nine. And that worked again as as a level uh, back in July of last year, so just um, a year ago, obviously. Um, so we're we're looking to push into um, the highest we've been in a year on the on the FTSE 100. And to me, you know, it looks like obviously dependent on the, this week's events that we're going to do so. We've we've broken this trading range, and so you might say, well, the market's high here. Um, but you know, benefit of hindsight, we can say even if we'd bought. On that big breakout of those highs, um, discounting this small discount towards that previous peak here, um, we, we've we've still made further ground because that people have bought on the momentum of the breakout of the old range. And um, if you use the height of this range as a gauge, so basically you could say conservatively five eight hundred to uh, six five hundred. It's a seven point seven hundred point range. So you'd be looking for seven two hundred, um, and uh, and pretty much back at the uh, yeah, back above in above record highs in the FTSE one hundred if you projected this old range from where we broke out. Um, looking across to um, to Europe a fairly clearly defined downward sloping trend line here I think if we get a close above this trend line again that's that's a uh, you know it's not a horizontal resistance at this point it's down sloping um, I think that would probably take us to 10 500 and, and the highest that we've been in a year if um, if we can succeed in a breakthrough there um, again the momentum high, higher lows being formed in the RSI and then moving above the previous peak um, just about getting into that old area so it's really about whether the resistance breaks um, at this point you know it's either a sell at the resistance failing or when the resistance clears it's um, you know, it's a buy on the breakout uh, so you know you can use different criteria um, for, for wh you know whether you believe that breakouts happened or is going to sustain um, you know, obviously that's a matter for a specific trading system, but this is certainly right where we are here is is the level to watch. It looks to me, given the fact that we're back above, back above the 200 day moving average, we, this was the, the gap lower after Brexit, we've recovered that. It looks to me like the market wants to go higher, but again we have to we have to take out this trend line first. So sliding over to, to currency markets, we had a look at the the yen, but let's have a look at the uh, the euro here because obviously last week we had the the European Central Bank, and I, I, it was notable on that day that um, the market was basically hovering around 110, which is obviously a big round number, and uh, that what we were watching for is you know can will the ECB disappoint with no more policy stimulus, and if so, if they disappoint and don't do anything to try and weaken the euro, the euro should bounce. It had a very modest bounce on the day, um, and then actually, um, you know, pretty much moved into the lows, and on the Friday, uh, dropped and closed below 110 for the first time in a while. Uh, for the first time since, you know, if you look at closing, obviously it's tested several times but never actually closed on Friday it did close to me that was a bit of a shift and I think RSI is drifting down we broke this rising trend of high momentum and the RSI here we dropped down on the Friday and um, you know of course we can have short-term bounces but to me the, the 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 trend now in in the euro is, is lower so I think the nat the natural area that we probably need to test if we're closing below 110 is just above 108 where we had a strong rebound back in March.
looking at sterling we've got a um, a potential inverse head and shoulders setting up here so this being the the left shoulder this being the head and then this being the right shoulder the action from Friday suggests that this pattern may fail and so then really what we've you know again back to the round numbers concept is really to my mind what we're looking at here is is, is 130 you know that's we, we tried to push lower on 130 didn't succeed and we bounced quite nicely but obviously there's still a fair bit of uncertainty about the effect of uh, Brexit on the UK and on the the Bank of England who have hinted that they're going to perhaps cut interest rates at the next meeting in August which will obviously be a, a negative thing for the pound and so still you know we've got that big bounce higher off the lows because 130 couldn't get taken out decisively uh, but it was more of a sort of short coving rally and people have sold into it so now what we want to see is this lower trend line pretty much holding perhaps with a dip down to 130 but then people buying at 130 again but that's that's the round number that we're really watching um, if 130 gives up then obviously the next one is just the, the low right at um, 128 but if we do get some movement off these levels then the next one is um, then you know really logically the market needs to test the previous highs or perhaps just below them with this down sloping trend line connecting these two peaks here above there you know you're basically projecting the height of the pattern above so we could see a good old recovery in in sterling should this um, inverse head and shoulders take out you know ha uh, happen and i think back above that um that low that we decisively dropped through should we get above this this declining trend line and this um and this uh, pattern actually does complete Euro sterling is uh, very much dominated by sterling at the moment and so you can sort of see that um, we've drifted very sideways at the moment um, even though it looks like we're losing momentum I'm, I'm, you know would still be because we're making higher highs and higher lows um, I would still be biased towards um, going along the market because of the, the general uptrend but I think if this trend line here which only has two touches on it but it's the, kind of the best thing we have to go by at the moment and think if that if that gets taken out to the downside um, then you've got to kind of change your change your outlook a little bit and expect a drop down to test the previous peak and then potentially this area down here um, below below 80 um, that was was causing a fair bit of resistance in, in the past So, you know, when you are trading maybe just one specific market, maybe you're even just ca trading cable, uh, pound against the dollar. If you see uh, the pound, uh, the pound dollar taking out that um, that neckline, have a look across to to euro sterling and see if it's taking out this rising trend line as well. If if that confirms, it just adds a bit of credence to the trade. It just shows that the um, the uh, the pound is in fact gaining value, not just against the dollar, but um, you know, it's a general sense of strength in the pound. Let's shift over to commodities. One thing you know at the moment that oil has been pretty lackluster. Let me bring up the uh, the Brent chart. Um, it's not really particularly going far, but obviously we again we, 50 is the big round number here, and we just couldn't really gain any traction above 50. Uh, we didn't even get up to uh, where did we go? 50 two and change and rolled over and so right now just as as we as we stand uh, on I believe the low on Friday was pretty much 45 4501 so we've dropped right down to another big handle which is 45 so it's a round number you know we we attempted temp to, to jump off it before just ahead of it now we've dipped down right to it to my mind we're making lower lows momentum seems to be falling off we're holding at the moment but if this RSI drops this RSI 40 level drops in Brent and and we, and we continue to take out and we take out this low to me it suggests that we're um you know the the momentum to the downside is picking up at the moment the tr on this short term basis the trend is down and i don't think there's any signs yet that the market's about to turn around and you, the, really the best confirmation as the chart currently looks would be for a break above 
this downward sloping trend line would tell you that you're on the right side of the trend. Of course, you can buy it lower and, and get it right, um, but you, you know, you're kind of uh, buying into the trend reversal before it happens if you are doing that. The other big one is gold. Gold is um, a big mover around the uh, the Fed meeting. So if you're looking for something to trade um, on the um, on the Fed, and I should mention that we've obviously got our Federal Reserve um, specific webinar as well that we're going to be holding. Uh, but if you're looking for something specific on the on the day, um, gold is a big mover. And dolly yen may not be it normally is a good one because we've got the Bank of Japan so soon afterwards dolly yen maybe not but um I would say sterling and, and euro dollar would be um uh, likely big movers on, on this fed meeting depending on what happens of course if it's if it's a neutral null event as I'm sort of thinking it probably will obviously the moves are going to be less than if something surprising happens but uh gold has been drifting off and, and losing momentum and I think it's you know it's it's happening it happened a bit later but it's it's happening at a similar time now as as oil they're both dollar based commodities you know there's a bit of an expectation that the Fed is just gonna be slightly more hawkish at this meeting and the dollar's gaining a bit of strength I don't think there'll be that much more hawkish and maybe that will be the opportunity for gold to rebound we're at a pretty significant level now 1300 is the big round number uh, but if we pull out to the weekly chart you know, we're obviously at the uh, the highs from January 2015, which we tested here and rolled away from, broke above. Now, you know, this is this is how resistance works. You know, you break the the resistance works once, twice, fails. You come back to test the resistance as support, and then it works as support and rebounds. That's kind of the textbook theory. Obviously, that you know doesn't always work like the textbook. We can see 1300 taken out. If that does happen then uh, my assumption is that we drop down to where the momentum shifts pretty dramatically here again on the old Brexit vote uh, when gold spiked um, on sort of the, on the uncertainty of it all. One thing one thing to note for me about gold is that um, given that it gold is, all, is a safe haven so when stocks are dropping and people are worried gold can go up um, but one of the reasons that stocks would drop in the first place is that the uh, Fed uh, is maybe being a bit more hawkish and so that is a um, a good uh, thing for the dollar and so uh, you know when when the dollar is doing well um, gold is tending not to fare as well uh, but also the thing you have to consider is that the gold is a, an inflation hedge and um, if the Fed is looking to to raise rates they're obviously going to fend off inflation So I've covered the major markets that I would typically look at here and we're coming into the half an hour mark. Um, unless there's anything extra that you wanted me to take a look at, I think we'll we'll call it a day about there. Thank you very much for, for coming today and attending the webinar. Much appreciated. Hope there was some useful insight in there. Good luck with the trading this week. We've got some big central bank action. If you're trading into the individual shares, we've not really looked at those, obviously, but uh, a lot of earnings going on, which hopefully cause some, some movement in the wider indices as well. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Jasper signing out.